May grace, mercy, and peace be multiplied to you from God, the Father, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Ghost. The Word of God, which is the basis of the sermon this morning, is found in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 to 10, where we read as follows that portion of God's Word, which will be the sermon text. Then the Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. So far the text. The name of Jesus, who has called us to be laborers, workers in his vineyard, Dear fellow redeemed sinners and creatures of the one true only living, creating, and preserving triune God. What we have before us today is the call of the prophet Jeremiah. Here Jeremiah reports how God called him to be a prophet, to write two of the books of the Bible. This call of Jeremiah brings to mind five things, five misconceptions that most people have about Christianity. And those are the five things we'll discuss today. Most people out there don't have any idea what Christianity is. They think they do. They think they know all about Christianity. They may even think they're Christians. But they have five misconceptions about Christianity. And it's because of these five misconceptions, I think, that they don't go to church. First misconception. That uh, Christianity... Church is just for good feelings. That people who go to church go for this one reason. They go because it makes them feel good. That after a worship service or a church meeting of some kind, they walk out the door and they just feel better. And that's all Christianity is. It's just feelings. It's just sentimentality. It's just emotion. It just stirs up their emotions uh, and it makes them feel better to face the new week. And that's their idea of Christianity. It's sentimentalism. Well, we see this uh, when we see movies and television shows. When the when Hollywood tries to present Christianity it always comes out the same way. It's wrong, it's, it's, it's misrepresented, and it's presented as only a, a sentimental journey. Think of all the Hollywood movies about the Bible. The grand spectacles that play on people's emotions. It doesn't bring out the law and the gospel. It just brings out emotionalism like Hollywood does with their movies. And so that's... Most people's idea of Christianity. 
Oh, I, I saw a movie called The Bible once. That must be Christianity. I saw a movie called The Ten Commandments. That must be The Ten Commandments. That must be Exodus. That must be Moses. I even saw a movie about Jesus once. That must be it. Must be uh, the truth about Jesus. He was just a, a real uh, kind of a gentle man who spoke softly and made people kind of swoon. And that's where they get their idea of Christianity. It's just a, a sentimental jag. Well, here we have the call of Jeremiah, the prophet. Can you imagine how Hollywood would present this? If Hollywood had a movie called Jeremiah, and it opened up with the call of Jeremiah, it would have some huge cathedral with choirs singing, and Jeremiah with a very holy and pious look on his face, and God speaking to him out of the clouds, and some great spectacle. That's not what happened at all. Nothing here about a huge cathedral. Nothing here about the temple in Jerusalem. Even. He wasn't even in the temple when this happened. Just God came to him in his everyday, normal, workaday world and said, Jeremiah, I've got my eye on you. I've had my eye on you before you were even conceived. I've chosen you. Now get to work. No emotion, no sentimentalism, no choirs singing in the background. That's how God comes to you. That's how God comes to every Christian. It's not a sentimental jag. It's in your workaday, everyday, humdrum world. Every day, he comes to you with his word, with his baptism, with his Lord's Supper, with the Holy Ghost, working secretly and silently in your soul. That's Christianity. Now, there's nothing wrong with emotions. There's nothing wrong with sentimentalism. But they have their place. If they take the place of action, That's not their place. If anything, God stirs up emotions in in us to stir us to action. To make us do. As he called Jeremiah, I've got work for you to do. Now go do the work. Do the action. That's Christianity. It, It rules your life. Not just your emotions. It rules the decisions that you make every day. How you spend your time. First misconception of of Christianity is pure sentimentalism. Just there to make you feel good. And if I already feel good, why should I go to church? I don't need Christianity, I already feel good. Second misconception about Christianity is, well, yeah, there's Ten Commandments. Yeah, there's there's the Bible. Yeah, there's the law of God. God God tells us what to do. But he doesn't really expect us to do it. He expects us to sin. And it's okay with him. When God tells us to do something in the Bible... Well, he wants us to, you know, kind of think about it. We might even try a little bit to do some of it. But most of the time, we just kind of go with the flow, go with the crowd, follow, follow the sheep, and do what the world does. And that's all right with God. He doesn't really expect us to keep these commandments perfectly, That's what most people think. God doesn't expect us to obey his commandments 
perfectly. But look at this, what uh, God said to Jeremiah here, verse 5. I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations, all the nations, every human being on earth. He is to be a prophet to all the nations on earth. Now, Jeremiah's response in verse 6 is very similar to what most people respond to God's command. Oh, Lord God, that's too much. I can't do that. Maybe I could be a prophet to my family. Maybe I could even pull in a few other relatives. But all the nations? Ah, you're not serious, God. But did God expect Jeremiah to do exactly this? Yes. And Jeremiah has been a prophet to all the nations, even down to us today. We still have his... Inspired writing before us in the Bible today. But most people have this misconception when God gives them a command, one of the Ten Commandments or whatever. They just say, well, yeah, I'm only human. I'm only human, God. Uh, that's too idealistic to think I could just do everything you command me to do, God. Come on. In my ministry, over the many years since I took my first call at the age of 25, yes, I've, I've heard, I've heard, not directly necessarily, but indirectly from members of my congregations, this pastor's too strict. He's too strict. He really expects us to do everything in the Bible. You believe that? That's even in the church, let alone people outside the church. They have this misconception, God doesn't expect us to do everything that he commands us to do. They look at the law of God as some some vague ideal. But Jesus said, be ye doers of the word not hearers only deceiving your own selves. Blessed is he that heareth the word of God and doeth it. The Bible says, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Jesus said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Yes, God expects perfect obedience to his commandments. He demands perfection. Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. As God demanded perfection from Jeremiah. He really meant it. I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. That's why when we come to confess our sins, we say, with which I have ever offended thee. Even those I cannot know or remember, every single sin is wrong. Every single breaking of your commandment, God, is terrible. The wages of sin is death. Not just sins, but sin. One sin. The wage is death. The Bible says, whosoever shall keep the, the law in all points and yet offend once, he is guilty of all. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and God gave them the command, you shall not eat of this tree. He said, the day you eat of it, you shall die. Not the fifth time you eat of it, you shall die. Or I kind of expect you to eat of it every now and then. He didn't even allow once for them to eat of the forbidden fruit. 
Most people think, no, I don't have to keep the commandments of God perfectly. I don't even have to keep them very well. All I have to do is keep them better than other people around me. As long as, I, as long as I'm better than the other people around me, that's all God expects. And so they compare themselves by looking at society, comparing themselves to other people. That's no way to confess your sin. We cannot see our sin by looking at society. Let me tell you something. China. They, they forbid Christian missionaries. But there are underground missionaries in China, Christians. And what these underground missionaries report is that the hardest thing they run into with the Chinese is that the Chinese look at America and Western Europe and they say, well, that's where Christianity came from. But look at their societies. They're sick. They're sick with adultery. They're sick with homosexuality. They're sick with drugs. They're sick with crime. And they say, why would we want to be part of a religion that came out of that? You can't see your sin by looking at our society. Even the heathen. See our society as sinful and unclean. God does mean for us to keep his commandments perfectly. Every single one. Just like he expected Jeremiah to be a prophet to all the nations. First misconception that people have about Christianity is just a sentimentalism thing. Second is, God doesn't really expect us to keep his commandments. And therefore, we're still good people. We don't need the church. We don't need God. We don't need the Bible. We don't need a Savior. We're good people. Third misconception about Christianity. The whole thing can be put off to the future. Don't need to do anything about it today got all kinds of other things in my life going on today. I'll put this religion thing off to the future. That's what most people think. Well, let's look at the call of Jeremiah. At first, Jeremiah had the same attitude, didn't he? In verse 6, he says, For I'm not a child. I'm just a child. Wait till I grow up, and then I'll be a prophet to the nation. But how did God say? Answer him, verse 7, that the Lord said to me, say not, I am a child. I want you to go out and start right now. This day, he says, this day, verse 10, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdom. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. You put it off, you may not have another opportunity. You don't know. Most people use the excuse, God, wait till later. I'll, 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 I'll take care of it later, God. Uh, down some, in some distant point in the future. I don't know when. But I'll take care of it sometime. But not now. Christianity is something for way off in the future, not today. And so they don't come to church today. They might come years from now, but not today. First misconception, Christianity is just emotion. Second, God doesn't expect perfect obedience to his commandments. Third, you can put it off forever for the unknown future. Fourth misconception about Christianity in our society. Oh, Christianity, church, you know what that is? That's where people go to try to improve themselves. 
to improve. It's a self-improvement religion. You're already good, but you want to get a little bit better. So you go to church. Well, I'm already pretty good. I really don't need to improve myself right now. And if I do, I've got other ways to improve myself. Self-improvement religion. As if you have some innate goodness within you that you just need to get a little bit better by yourself. That's what they think Christianity is. Well, Jeremiah kind of had that misconception at first, didn't he? He said uh, uh, in verse 6, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I don't have any uh, uh, ability. Uh, I need to get better. Well, the fact is, Jeremiah couldn't speak by himself. He couldn't speak the word of God by himself. He couldn't be a prophet of the nations by himself. God wasn't expecting him to improve himself and do it all himself. Christianity is not a self-improvement religion. We cannot do anything, Jesus said. Without me, you can do nothing. You can't improve yourself without me. I'm the vine, you're the branches. You cut yourself off from me, you're, you die and you're burned in the fire. You have no innate goodness. You have no innate abilities to serve God. You look at verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. It's all God's doing. It's not us. Christianity is not a self-improvement religion. It's God doing everything for us. By his grace. God does not require any ability in you. We have the hymn, Just as I am, I come. All God requires in you is that you don't reject it You don't say, well, I heard the word of God and I don't believe it. That's all he requires of you. Don't reject it. He'll bring you to that faith. The Holy Ghost will come to you through his word and through sacraments, baptism, Lord's Supper. He'll bring you to that faith. If you don't stop him, if you don't hinder him, reject him, outside of that, he does it all. He comes to you through his word, through his sacraments. He brings you to faith in Jesus Christ as God, not just some man who lived 2,000 years ago, but as God Almighty himself who came down from heaven for one reason, to pay for your disobedience, to pay for your imperfection, to pay for for the fact that you cannot obey his commandments perfectly, he said, I will go down, I will live a perfect life as a man, I will obey all the commandments perfectly, and then I will give my perfect life unto death and hell. I will collect the wages of their sin for them. Don't reject that. Don't push that away. Don't say, I don't need that. I don't believe that. Let the Holy Ghost work that belief in you. Not in yourself, but in Jesus Christ. Now, do you think, does anyone think that God would have gone to all the trouble of leaving his throne on high, coming down to this cesspool in his eyes, this dung heap, as the Bible calls it, to live among sinners, most of whom who hated him, 
subject himself to that shame, to that suffering, to that punishment, to that crucifixion, all of that for nothing? Just so that you would have to suffer then too? Of course not. He did it so you would not have to suffer. He didn't waste his time. It wasn't in vain. He took all your punishment for your sin. And then he rose from the dead to prove it. Christianity is not an appeal to your better nature because you don't have a better nature. You have a sinful nature. But when God comes to to you through his word, he changes that nature. And then he gives you just the beginnings of that image of God that Adam and Eve lost in the Garden of Eden, which will be fully restored in heaven. When God called Jeremiah, he didn't say, Jeremiah, I'm calling you because you're such a talented guy, because you're such a a, a great, a good person. It was all, God, I will do it for you. I will do it for you. Look at verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee. Christianity is not a self-improvement religion. God says to us in the Bible, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. The Apostle Paul then said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. misconceptions about what Christianity is out there. First, it's just nothing but emotion. Secondly, God doesn't really expect perfection in keeping his commandments. Thirdly, you can put it off to the future, the far distant future. And then also, it's a self-improvement religion. All Misconceptions. There's one more. The misconception that, well, if if Jesus, if God the Son, paid for all of my sins, then I can just go ahead and sin. I'll sin deliberately. I'll sin willingly. And God will forgive me for Jesus' sake. The churches are full of people like this. living in willful, unrepented sin. And they think they're Christians. They think that's Christianity. They think Jesus died on a cross so they could sin. Well, Jeremiah, after he had this call of God, what did he do? Did he go out and say, well, (laughs) forget that. I'm just going to go on as I always have. I'm just going to Go on sinning as I always did. I'm going to go on uh, not being a prophet. No, it changed his whole life. He did become a prophet. He came, became a prophet to all the nations. It changed him. He became a new creature. And so does true Christianity. We no longer love sin. We hate sin. When we do it, We're ashamed. We hate it. And we fall at God's feet and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I repent. And he says to us, I forgive you. Go and sin no more. Christianity. Last night I watched a movie called Benedict Arnold. It was about the Revolutionary War and the great General Benedict Arnold, who then turned against America. Had a lot about George Washington. George Washington 
loved Benedict Arnold until he turned traitor. He was his favorite general. He wanted to promote him to second in command under himself. George Washington was all about patriotism. Are you, are you with me or are you against me? Are you a patriot? Are you fighting for the uh, revolution? Are you fighting for the freedom of the United States of America or aren't you? Now what if Washington had gone up into the Allegheny Mountains and found this recluse living in a little shack on the side of the mountain and this, this, uh, this, this recluse says to George Washington, I'm a patriot! Yes, sir, I am patriot. I really believe in the cause of the revolution. You think uh, George Washington would have believed him? Of course not. You can no more be a patriot in the American Revolution on the side of an Allegheny Mountain than a toadstool or a mushroom. The patriot was the one who joined Washington's army and stood in the front line of the battle amidst the roar of the conflict. The patriot was the one who did something. The patriot was the one who, who, who marched the tedious mile after mile marches. It's the same with Christianity. You can't go on living in sin, doing nothing to try to obey the commandments of God. That just shows you don't love him. But you don't believe in him. You have no gratitude to him. If a person says he's a Christian, I ask him, what on earth are you doing for Christ's sake? Five misconceptions of Christianity brought out in this call of Jeremiah. One, it's nothing but pure emotion. You just go to get a good feeling. Secondly, God doesn't really mean his Ten Commandments. He doesn't expect perfection and obedience. Third misconception, we can put it off forever. Today is not the day of salvation. I'll do it some unknown time down the road. Fourthly, Christianity is just a self-improvement religion. And fifthly, I can believe in Christ as my Savior from sin and still live in sin. Five misconceptions. But God said to Jeremiah, and you can find these in this passage, I formed thee, I knew thee, I sanctified thee, I ordain thee, I send thee, I command thee, and I am with thee. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all of man's understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.